Good afternoon and welcome to today's talent and culture panel discussion called Dissecting Disengagement in the Current Talent Landscape. My name is Martha Watt and I'm the Managing Director for Salos Human Resource Practice here in the Midwest. We provide interim experience consultants in human resources and finance to organizations nationally. And I'm pleased to serve as one of the chairs for the Executive Club's Talent and Culture Forum, along with Daniel Mason of WTW and Kim Swoboda of Aspiration Catalyst. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. Our CHR panel discussion today will focus on the continued talent challenges we're seeing now and into 2023, and how organizations are flexing to support both the employee and the employer's needs. Our CHRO panel represents a variety of industries and cultures, and will share what's working and what they're continuing to explore to further engage their workforces and prepare leaders in this new hybrid work world. And now it's my privilege to introduce Daniel Mason, who will introduce our moderator and panelists. Great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Mason. I'm the employee experience business leader for WTW in the greater Chicago area. And also I'm one of the talent and culture forum co-chairs. We have assembled a terrific panel today to really get into some of the major issues that we're seeing facing talent and HR professionals today. We are pleased to welcome Arnold Green, the head of North American HR at Northern Trust, Amber Kennelly, the CHRO at William Blair, and Katie Lawler, the SVP and Chief Human Resources Officer at ITW. Our moderator today is Radhika Papandreou, Managing Partner of Chicago at Corm Ferry. Our panelists have a lot that they're hoping to cover. There's a lot of questions we're, we're looking to get their insights on. Uh, if you do have any questions, please add them to the Q&A box. And with that, I will pass things over to you, Radhika. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dan. Appreciate the introduction. I am so excited to moderate this panel today with these wonderful uh, CHROs. And what I think is really interesting, we're gonna get perspective not only in different industries, but also the tenure of our executives are different. Katie has been at her organization for a number of years and is very deep and involved in the HR journey and has experienced the headwinds that we're facing before COVID as well as sort of through COVID and, and as we come out. Um, Amber and Arnold are a little bit newer to role, so they're in that diagnostic phase, and I think that their perspectives are going to be really interesting as well. So um, without further ado, I'd love to dive in, and we're going to start out with this idea of culture and what we need to do around culture and engagement in the environment we're living in today. And Katie, if you don't mind, if I, don't, if I can start with you, how do we define and think about the evolution of culture given the high turnover we've seen and the hybrid environments we're working in and sort of broadly the challenges that we've had. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me. This is um, a fantastic topic and uh, it's near and dear to me as I'm sure it is to many of uh, those who've dialed in. Uh, just real quick, ITW, also known as Illinois Toolworks, we're um, a large diversified global manufacturer. So in the US, we have about 16,000 employees uh, about 45,000 total. So when we talk about our culture, it's a very global culture. Uh, within ITW, it's been around for over 100 years. We design and make uh, commercial industrial products of all shape and size. And about two thirds of our workforce are uh, aligned to our op manufacturing operations. So it'll be a good compare contrast with Arnold and Amber's organizations. You know, culture is really special at ITW because we use a proprietary business model and there are three elements to it. And one element is our decentralized entrepreneurial culture. So it's uh, pretty well defined and long standing in our organization. But as we think about culture in this call it post COVID world, it's really re examining what that culture is and how our employees are really experiencing it when you think about stresses of the last couple of years, certainly as we've introduced workplace flexibility and, and hybrid working uh, relationships. 
And then you think about the competitive talent landscape, right? And, and what uh, employees are saying that they want, need, and maybe even demand from their employers. And so I think it's a really great opportunity for us as, uh, as leaders of our organizations to kind of revisit our culture. Is it alive and well? You know, does it need some readjustment uh, given this changing landscape? And if so, how do we implement it? Um, and even in an organization that's been around as long as ITW that's had this well-defined culture, I think we're, we're finding the opportunity to revisit uh, our so-called employee experience. I'll talk a little bit about a project we have underway later uh, in terms of how our most important employee groups are really experiencing IATW, what's bringing them to our company, and most importantly, what's keeping them here, which is obviously, at the end of the day, the most important consideration for us. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit about that, the stickiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you create that in your environment today? Yeah, well, you know, this project that we have underway, uh, we're working with a third party to kind of revisit. We have a well-defined culture framework. Back in 2018, we actually put pen to paper to say, this is what our culture is. And it really serves as a guide for our leaders in terms of how they lead. Are they leading consistent with our culture? As well as what can employees expect um, in their experience working for ITW. One thing that we've kind of come back to reassess is, is there consistency in our culture across our global organization, across a variety of leaders that we have uh, in different parts of the world and in different parts of our country. Some are now working in a more hybrid environment. Some are obviously still in the workplace on the manufacturing floor. So we just ask this question, do we have sufficient consistency in our culture? And so this past year, we've been embarking on focus groups and, and ways to get feedback from what we've identified as our seven most important talent segments. And we're from our hourly workforce up to our um, more senior leaders and asking some really open questions in terms of uh, their experience uh, working for ITW and what's most important. We're kind of collating that feedback now to, to really kind of come back and, and put some guidance and direction out in terms of what do we need to do better to um, ensure that uh, consistency of the experience and how our culture shows up. Um, and I think it's been a nice opportunity to do that now more than ever, given that we have really strong alignment across our leadership team in terms of the talent imperative. Yeah. Great. And maybe I, I'll, I'll throw that stickiness question out to both Amber and Arnold first. Maybe Amber, I'll start with you at William Blair. Talk a little bit about that and what you're saying. Yeah, certainly. So I appreciate that. Um, as you mentioned in your introduction, right, I am definitely in a diagnostic phase. I hit two months with William Blair yesterday. Um, just in terms of background, William Blair is the premier global boutique with expertise in investment banking, investment management, and private wealth management. Katie, like you, we have offices globally. So we have 20 offices worldwide and definitely, you know, adapting to this new norm is, front of mind for everyone. Coming in as a new employee during this time also is, you know, it provides, it provides me an opportunity. I know Arnold, we talked about this as well, right? It gives us an opportunity to really see what it's like to be coming in and onboarding in a hybrid environment. Um, in terms of stickiness, I do feel very fortunate that William Blair has a deep and rich culture um, it is a very values-based organization. And a couple of the things that I've observed that I do think really help in terms of the stickiness during this time um, is really um, encouraging the leadership to spend the time to make the connections with people, whether they are in the office or whether they're you know, on a Zoom call like this, but um, really focusing on creating that space for our managers and our leaders to have conversations with their new younger employees in many cases in our business um, to help them understand what their journey has looked like, um, you know, what the opportunities are for the individuals and really kind of laying out all of the, all of the, the goodness that there is, um, both current in role, but then kind of painting that picture forward so that they really can begin you know, they can really begin to see themselves in the organization, not just now during this kind of 
reestablishment period, but you know, kind of many, many years in the future. So I think I think it really is about building those connections, making the space, um, and then reinforcing those behaviors. And Arnold, it would be great to hear from you as well. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And as mentioned, I, I guess I'm in the middle of the Dream Team panel where I've uh, been with uh, Northern Trust for now uh, seven months. Um, and um, Northern Trust uh, is a, a bank here in the Chicagoland area with global reach. Uh, we focus on wealth management, asset management, asset servicing, 25,000 or so employees globally. So, you know, I think um, we're all facing some of the similar pieces uh, in and around how do we continue to drive culture and um, our culture has been one that um, has been uh, sticky pre pandemic. Um, we have a culture that is very collegial. We have a culture that is very service oriented. Three of our tenants uh, that help to build our um, our culture in and around service, expertise, and integrity. Um, but of course, we've all been faced with the pandemic and have to redefine how um, we do that and, and, and do it at a, a different way, right? We can't come back to what was normal. Um, and so a part of what we're doing, I know Katie mentioned the partner experience, we must have either replicated that since we're all, uh, since ITW and Northern Trust are part of uh, some of the Smith family's holdings, uh, but we're doing a partner experience and it's really in and around uh, setting up some pillars for success um, for how we treat, take care of our employees and uh, certainly things like flexibility and uh, working on continuing to refine our, cult refine our culture. Um, we're, we're looking at a number of things and I would say the most important thing is we're listening to our employees. Right. I mean, there is this is not a peanut butter fix um, for stickiness. Um, it is a listening to your employees and then um, creating a strategic plan to keep it sticky, if you will. So excited for what's to come. And um, uh, as Amber mentioned, I'm excited to be a part, a new part uh, of a team that really is focused on culture and how we can do it better day to day. Right. And. And in that context, as I think about people actually coming back to the office, and Amber, I'll throw this question out to you. Um, firstly, if you could share with the audience sort of what your policy is from a company-wide perspective, but then ju just talk to us a little bit about how do you make the office worthwhile again? How do you make that space some place where people want and need to gather? Yes, absolutely. So to answer your first question, our organization at this point has what we're calling anchor days, where we're kind of guiding people towards Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, each of our business units and even our teams might have slightly different nuances related to the number of anchor days or you know which of those days. But it is it is really about trying to get you know some group of employees back into the office at the same time so that we can feel that culture and feel um, the benefits of being together. So anchor days is kind of our approach. And then how do we go about making it worthwhile, right? I think many of us during the, during the pandemic appreciated, for example, not commuting. So when I think about making it worthwhile, it's how do we kind of overcome that negative, per, you know, perceived negative side to accommodate or to encourage people to be coming in and you know, I've seen so far at William Blair several, I think, really effective approaches. And then at my previous employer, you know, we were certainly trying trying some of the same things. But it's it's about you know creating meetings or opportunities to come together for people who are in the office, trying to create a a reason for coming in, having people feel that connection, that emotional connection, physically, you know, physical proximity. Um, we've created things like celebrations, training opportunities, um, community giving. So a give back event um, is also a great way to, you know, people really feel good to be coming in then when they know they're also going to be giving back. Um, we've, we've just opened, I think, interestingly, a, um, a tech support bar in one of our offices. 
So it's really nice to have that at our fing literal fingertips. You just walk up to them. Um, and so I think it's about kind of creating moments that matter in the office so that people kind of get past the habits or the previous routines of not doing this. One other addition that I might add, people really like food. We know this to be true. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I would say that in many of our offices, right, we have definitely tried to support uh, people coming together through food in a cafe, in a cafeteria, in, in different spaces. Um, and, you know, again, only two months in, but I've really, I've really enjoyed watching our people enjoy coming in, talking to each other, meeting with each other and having a reason, a reason that matters for them to do that. Yeah. Those are a few things. And I would say, and, and just um, as an aside, I mean, I work at a talent management firm and we're having the same issues why I'm smiling, right? That, you know, that's the irony. We're all kind of going through that. Um, and I do have pizza Wednesdays and there's a big uptick and <laughs> in, in, in people coming in. Right. Um, right. To that in, point, in, I, I was in, literally on a call yeah. this morning, you know, and I was talking with our legal team about many of these same questions. And, you know, it is true. Literally every organization around the world is trying to figure out what's going to work for them. So we have a lot of company in asking these questions and really thinking about these questions. That's right. That's right. And I guess, you know, to that, you know, extent with Katie, with your workforce, you have deskless workers. I love that term that you brought up um, on, on, on the call earlier. I would love for you to sort of define what that is. And then how do you deal with that dichotomy between the office population that you have and the people in the manufacturing plants themselves and, you know, make sure people understand the why around coming in or not coming in? Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, if you think about the nature of our business at the core, we're an organization that physically needs to come together to design, develop, and manufacture our products. Servicing our customers, that's a little broader approach, but we, we are never going to be a fully remote entity, <laughs> just not, not feasible. Uh, but when we think about workplace flexibility and, and we wrestle with that, we, we don't have a singular approach, by the way. We don't have a single policy enterprise-wide. Uh, here in our corporate office, for example, we're all uh, professionals. So we kind of follow the mantra, be in the office more than you're not in the office. But one of the propositions there is, in addition to kind of our cultural considerations, is that you know, as a corporate office, we're supporting an organization that's primarily in our um, manufacturing facilities, right? And 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 then engineers uh, and operators. And so there is this kind of expectation that, you know, we're not going to be fully remote. We're going to be in the workplace. We're going to engage and make it purposeful, which I think is important. When you think about our so-called deathless workers, you know, 60% of our workforce that has never stopped working on site since COVID hit of March of 2020, right? And I, I give, these are the colleagues that were so critically important to us during that time period, getting out of bed every morning, putting their face mask on and coming to work uh, in a really uncertain uh, time as, as we all experienced. And so how do we think about this really important um, core of our workforce? And you know, we, we talk about the deathless worker, it's uh, BCG, I can't say we coined the term, BCG has done a lot of work around this and done a lot of surveying. And no surprise in this really hyper-competitive um, talent landscape, uh, hourly workers in all industries um, really have had their pick of jobs. And, and their foremost consideration has been compensation you know, the hourly wage, but then what is the differentiator at the end of the day? Again, that's going to create that stickiness beyond just paying them uh, competitively. And so there is this consideration on so-called work-life balance for our hourly employees and trying a bunch of different approaches to think about being creative uh, and having these schedules that can work um, better for employees that are paid by the hour. And that means, you know, shifting schedules. Like we've got a big facility in Wisconsin that's done a lot of change in terms of scheduling and trying to provide more flexibility and going from summer hours to fall when school starts 
uh, allowing people the opportunity to split their shifts between locations. And I think what's positive about this is competitive uh, marketplace is really forcing our managers to think differently about hourly talent. And, and it's in our business, it's such an important talent segment. We can't treat it as a commodity. Uh, it's just as important as many other uh, talent segments. And I think the other last comment I'd make is this appreciation of uh, the difficulty in finding um, really specialized skill sets in our business. That's hugely important, right? We need people that can come in and maintain highly automated equipment. And there used to be this mentality, we'd go out and just buy it. And now the, it's not just not feasible, right? So working with our frontline supervisors and managers to appreciate, we got to really invest in this core talent segment. We got to build it because we can't buy it. And so flexibility is going to be a huge piece of that as we, we talk about the retention and that stickiness. Not, not as easy to do, but uh, as important. Great. And you use the word work-life balance. I think that's a great segue because I think we're all mm -hmm. thinking about wellness and well-being as part of culture. And Arnold, I'm going to throw this to you. Um, how are you seeing that sort of that wellness aspect, the well-being, the work-life balance um, of your employees? And what kind of tools are you guys using around helping um, your employee base with that? Yeah, you know, I, you know, when I think of simplifying what human resources is, we are a resource for the humans, right? And that's in every iteration and stage of their career. And so, you know, the pandemic certainly, I think, has added to the necessity for making sure you have a structured, formalized well-being uh, program, um, because the reality is that these are a new set of circumstances that our employees are now dealing with, whether it's relative to their families, their personal lives, et cetera. They're not only professionals, um, and we want them to bring their full self, self to work. So of course we have um, some of the traditional resources that many may have the, you know, um, the EAP employee assistance programs where our employees can call in. Um, but we've also partnered uh, with a company um, by the name of Optum, um, who really focuses in on well-being and, you know, allowing um, a partnership with an expert in that space um, allows our employees to have more broadened. Uh, resources as it relates uh, to wellness. Um, I would also say, you know, crucial for um, really helping people to understand it is okay to have work-life balance um, and it is okay to focus in on your well-being. You have to have top of the house communication. CEO, um, in our case, um, has really um, been progressive in terms of sharing that at the highest level that well-being is important. And so of course that cascades through the organization and even if it wasn't important to others, it becomes important. And I think that's you know, been so valuable for us that they're hearing it from our top leader, leader of course, with support from our board of directors. Um, and uh, then the final thing I would say is, you know, many of us learn from uh, differently rather and um, so we've really ramped up our um, total rewards team has done a very nice job of ramp ramping up literature that you can put your fingers on around many topics and then around well-being. Um, and so again, it's not a one size fits all. It's customized, if you will, to the employee's optionality and being able to go out and take a read, take a look at what's important um, for, for them. So, you know, I'll round that off. Um, with the final piece I heard about in the moment. And I think that's also very critical in how we approach employees' well being, right? And so when you think about some of the unfortunate uh, situations we've even had um, recently here in Chicago, the, the, the shooting uh, that we had, um, you know, Hurricane Ian that came through and decimated parts of Florida, you know, how do you have? a structured, um, a, a, an approach that um, with some level of immediacy is um, helping our employees in their time of need. I, I just couldn't imagine being in a time of need and trying to think through it myself. And so, you know, in the Hurricane Ian 
um, piece as an example. I was really proud of how our team down in Florida galvanized um, resources, i.e. we had laundry service, we had showers, we you know, allowed some of our employees and their families and their fur families um, to go to some of our wealth management offices and live there um, for a couple of few th days. So, you know, we talk about partner experience. Well, partner experience is always great when it's great. But in my mind, partner experience is the best when you need it and when there's adversity. So I also think that's a part of the well-being, taking some of the load off of some of our people when they're going through adverse situations. Great. And I think that leads us into this question around leadership. Arnold, you did mention it's coming from the top, from your board, from your CEO. The other question is, the message that could be getting out there, but are leaders modeling that behavior for themselves? So maybe Amber, as we kind of go into the leadership side of the discussion, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how do we make sure leaders actually model the behaviors that we're looking for as we keep, you know, um, sort of refining culture uh, with the macro environment we're in? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, Arnold, I think you mentioned kind of tone at the top and, and it really does matter. Um, to be able to look to the leadership and see them, you know, participating in any of the events that we're putting together, um, coming into the office, giving back to the community during the community events, et cetera. I feel very fortunate that the leadership at William Blair is wholly supportive of this. Um, we are an organization that is very much about um, giving back to community, entrepreneurship, um, you know, kind of client focus and, and having that values-based mission in the first place matters because then we can, you know, as our leaders are demonstrating, we have, we have a way to speak to, you know, what we're, what we're watching and what we're observing. I do think it is about um, kind of making clear the expectations from the top communicating, being transparent, being authentic, as, as we see people in offices celebrating it, speaking to it, kind of sharing and calling it out. Um, it's interesting, I was having a conversation with someone and, and really it is about, um, in my opinion, it is about kind of breaking inertia, right? We've been at home, many of us, Katie, not all of your people, but many of us have been at home over a period of time, we've built new habits, um, and now we need to kind of just reestablish and giving people the support and the space, again, speaking to it, communicating it, appreciating it when you see it, um, giving people the, the fun elements that we've talked about, but also just the, you know, the benefits of being connected to people in the offices is really important. And one of the things too, that um, just really sticks out in my mind as we're talking about you know, helping our leadership demonstrate the behaviors that we want and then using that to encourage others to come in. To me, it's really about making sure that it is the better option, helping people understand why coming in and being with your colleagues is the better option. Don't make it feel punitive. People don't like punitive. People you know, want to be a part of something that's great. So as we're talking about leaders coming into the office, different events in the office, that helps build a little bit of momentum and help shift the inertia, in my opinion. Great. And to that, I have an audience question that is very related to that, which is, you know, we, we've talked a bit about sort of leadership and what <laughs> they're doing and what we're doing, but what about leadership traits as we're looking at people to lead? You know, I've heard words throughout this conversation around culture, around flexibility, agility, right? Those types of um, leaders, but what else? And maybe, Katie, I'll throw this one out to you. You know, what are the leadership traits that are most important to continue building community, a healthy culture and performance in the new world we're in? Yeah, I, I, well, I think it's a lot harder to be a really great leader, right? For all the reasons that we've talked about, managing teams in a, in a hybrid or, or virtual uh, way, uh, trying to be more empathetic um, given um, the challenges that we're all facing personally and, and professionally. I, I do think that um, as we talk about uh, policies and ways to manage, ways to lead, um, 
there's a lot more ambiguity. And I think for leaders, one of the most important traits is being able to lead in a time of ambiguity, right? And not waiting to be told, not waiting for a specific uh, how-to manual or playbook. And I've seen a lot of great leaders really shine over the last two years um, because they're really trying to be authentic, um, being empathetic, uh, being a good listener, trying to understand where each of their team members is coming from to bring them together uh, to deliver exceptional results. And so it, it's been a unique opportunity to see, and, and it, they're coming from all demographics, um, but I think leading with a little more heart and soul, maybe than uh, a how-to manual, we've gotten so focused on our um, you know, being a great manager um now I think it's there's there's a more emotional element that we're looking for um and the neat thing that that does is I think it opens up a lot of leadership opportunity to people because those that can create followership uh in these really dynamic times are the individuals who are going to excel in our organizations yeah and, and as I think about how we evaluate at the top when we're recruiting, that's absolutely what we look for, the empathy, the courage, the agility, that followership. And you know, we evaluate very differently than we did 10 years ago. And a lot of it's to do with everything that we're talking about here. So yeah. I appreciate the old, that uh, Me versus we is, right? The, the, yes. the, we, the we leaders are the ones winning out. Um, and I think uh, the those who kind of modeled uh, from the me center are, are, are falling by the wayside. And if I could just tag to yeah. what uh, Katie there I mentioned there, I look at leadership in the framework of, I'll say three buckets, there's head, heart, and ears, um, right? And so I think most leaders um, tend to uh, stick with the head piece, analyzing, you know, um, being data-driven, et cetera, which is absolutely something leaders need. Uh, but I think currently we're probably in a space where we need more heart, uh, empathy, as Katie mentioned, and we need more ears. My grandfather once told me when I was a young kid and wouldn't listen to pretty much anything um, that Arnold, you have two ears and one mouth. Use your ears twice as much as you use your mouth. And that would be my coaching to our leaders. Um, yeah. you know, let's use our ears and listen and, 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 and understand and then move forward with trying to create some actioning that uh, would make it favorable for our employees. And, and further to that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amber. I was go just ahead. gonna say, Katie, one of the things that you mentioned that really resonated with me was um, this need to lead during these moments of great ambiguity, right? We don't have a playbook for this. We are building one while we're experiencing it. So, you know, really to helping to support the leaders and any of our colleagues um, during times that might feel a little uncomfortable. Um, you know, many of us, appreciate when we know what we're supposed to do and we're able to do it. And the reality is that in many circumstances today, right, it's a little different than that. And um, spending time getting to know your team in a different, you know, a different way, a more, a more personal, empathetic kind of way, you know, maybe that's something that historically we hadn't emphasized as much, but as we're building this new playbook, that's absolutely critical. Being comfortable, being a little bit uncomfortable and being able to lead when you don't know the answer, but to your point, Arnold, listening to everyone else, listening to your colleagues, listening to other leaders to be able to build the best path forward, right? These are new skills and um, it's, it's an exciting time because we are learning so much. And, and being okay, being a little bit uncomfortable is really important. So, so I'm gonna throw this out, another complexity to, to that question for, um, whoever wants to answer first. Uh, and that's around generational differences. We've got four generations working in our ecosystems. And how does that create, we know it creates complexity, but how, how do you deal with people's uh, value systems being slightly different from a generation to generation perspective? And how do you bring people together um, to, to get to the same goal, frankly? So maybe we'll start, um, Katie, it sounded like, looked like you might want to answer that one and then we'll go around the horn. <laughs> well, I wish I had a magic answer to, to, to that one. I, I don't. I think it's just further evidence of 
the complexity that our managers and leaders have to work within. I, I would say I do try to caution people. Let's when we talk about generational differences uh, or even gender or racial ethnic uh, ethnic differences. Um, try to avoid making assumptions too, right? It kind of goes back to Arnold, mm -hmm. use your mm -hmm. two ears and listen and understand where someone's coming from um, mm -hmm. before making a decision. Uh, and I think maybe sometimes we we start making assumptions about, I know I'm guilty of this with, with uh, two children who are uh, now, um, one's out in the workplace and one's soon to be, right? Let's try to understand where they're coming from help coach and and guide them to make the right decisions and appreciate the you know the corporate landscape shall we say um but also when we think about those who are uh, later in their career and how do we leverage their expertise uh, and bring generations together you know as a leader of a team and I think that's a, a a neat opportunity that our managers now have and again starting with understanding where everyone's coming from and how do we put the pieces together so it works well. Uh, but it's just one more element of, of a complex workplace. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, Arnold, Amber, on that? Yeah, I mean, just one other thing that, you know, two other things that I would add to that is, you know, to Katie's point, I don't think that there is, you know, stereotypes of one size fit all for, you know, generations, religious backgrounds, et cetera. I do think that, you know, we are fortunate to have external resources you know, that do a lot of deep work relative to generations and how um, to bridge the gap, et cetera. And so relying on organizations, um, you know, that can help with deeper, broader uh, research. And then the final thing that I would say, you know, in particular with the um, newer generation, right, um, you know, at least at Northern Trust, we have a couple of paths where we can gain insight and we can talk to um, the younger generation from a focus group standpoint, i.e. whether it's our high school co-op program and understanding high school students and what's important to them and aligning that with, with what's needed in the workplace. Um, our college um, students that are either coming to us from an internship perspective or recent grads. So we have opportunity um, to learn. And I would say that's the big work, right? That we need to learn and always keep a framework of learning. And as Katie said, not making assumptions, it may not be the same as maybe it was five years ago relative to bridging this gap. So, you know, I, I think it's just important for us to keep an open mind, uh, to be agile as we approach this and again, try to do what's best for our employees um, on the top line of that. Right. Yeah, I, I would just agree with the comment. Um, this is not a one size fits all and making assumptions doesn't serve us well. So really working to listen to what our colleagues need and you know want um, and then building a path forward that you know marries what our colleagues are looking for and what the organization really needs as well and trying to match those up in the best way. Um, in, in my experience anyway, we, we do have, you know, a, a large difference in ages, experiences, career tracks, everything. But um, when we try to just put everyone in a bucket and assume that that's what's going to work for them, I think that's when we fail. So as long as we're listening, working together, trying to understand, going back to purpose and values, you know, what matters, I think we'll be on a much better path and our employees yeah. will more appreciate. And I think our, our organizations will just be better off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as I think about how, how you guys answered this question, I think it also is important to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a whole, right? Not just generational, you know, we mentioned racial diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, um, there, you know, and I think we really need to figure out how to be inclusive and create structural inclusion. And with that comes that listening and the ability to be an agile leader, to hear things differently than you assume, right? Those are all very, very important and have become, I don't want to say more important because they've always been important, but highlighted now and people are focused on it. And we're really doing, I feel, you know, as, as I talk about this with clients all the time, that 
our clients are doing real work around this, just like yourselves. And I think that's, that's a very positive thing. So um, I know we have, just in terms of time, five minutes, I do want to touch on media because there's a lot of media hype in a way around what we're talking about. And there's a lot of opinions out there. So want to touch on that. And then we want to leave about 10 minutes for questions at the end from the audience. But just in terms of the media and what people are reading and hearing about, and I'd love each of your thoughts on this question. Um, how are they doing? If you had to give a scorecard in terms of the topics around quiet, quitting, the great regret, the great resignation, burnout, we're seeing a lot on all these topics. What, what is your view on that? And maybe any suggestions to change the conversation? Well, so, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, Amber. No, go ahead, Katie. I was laughing because for uh, the early part of my career, I worked uh, for almost 12 years in media. So um, I'd like to say I have a little objectivity, but uh, it's it's kind of frustrating, to be honest. You know, um, I, I've had the experience you walk into a board meeting and you start getting peppered with questions on topics that really don't have an application um, to our organization, but people hear it on the news, you know, the great resignation. Obviously we've been tracking turnover and monitoring that very closely. Um, we are in a fortunate position because we didn't do any job reductions or layoffs in connection with uh, 2020 and, and COVID. So we are a little better positioned, I'd say, coming out uh, of, of COVID. Uh, but I do think it's kind of reinforcing um, negative perceptions in the workplace that we then turn around and have to uh, counter. And I think I go back to the early comment about culture and that discussion, because it is so critically important. What are your employees experiencing in your workplace so that they can tune out the noise outside of our workplace? Um, and and appreciate the experience that they have with our organizations because there's a lot of um, you know uh, tech tends to drive the narrative right and our um, I would imagine our three workplaces are are not similar to Facebook, <laughs> uh, but even now with the layoffs coming out from the tech industry and and fake, Facebook's announcement earlier today, right? It kind of trickles down and and it just creates an anxiety because now employees are like, oh, are we gonna, are we gonna be next? Uh, and so I do think we just have to be really focused on our internal communication and messaging and I kind of go back making sure that our culture is as strong and as evident as it needs to be for our employees. Katie, I was going to respond with. Oh, much of what you just shared as well. It is it is really, um, yeah, I'll say frustrating to have these kind of taglines in the media that are very easy to pick up that we start hearing over and over um, in different channels. And I, I feel that it then creates or creates the need for us as organizations to communicate even more with our employees um, about our culture, our values, our employee kind of deal, what it means to be a part of William Blair or ITW or Northern Trust. Um, for every piece that they hear in the media, right, we have to offset that, or I feel like we, we have to offset that with multiple communications internally to reinforce. Um, like you, Katie, early, early with my previous organization, we were tracking um, turnover and it was not matching up with a great resignation. And you know, I, I would go into leadership meetings regularly reporting on this, that because we're hearing it does not mean it's true for us. It is like trying to put a peanut butter approach across all organizations in all different industries. And while it is perhaps tr there are pieces of truth, strings of tr truth there, it doesn't mean it's true for every organization. So let's take the time to really understand what's happening with our organization and where we're having challenges. And to your point, Arnold, listening with two ears, listening and then responding to what matters for our people, not just what shows up on the front page of a magazine or a newspaper or a news channel. It just, it just creates you know, the need for reinforcing communicating internally and making sure that we're staying true and really authentic to who we are and what our values are and making making that opportunity to listen and hear and share back with our employees even more important. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tag in. I mean, fortunately, I have two great 
uh, panelists that, um, you know, get it right. And so uh, there's probably not much that I need to add other than, you know, I don't know if we'll ever win the battle with media, right? So I'm not sure if you even put that much effort to trying as opposed to compartmentalizing and staying focused on what we do well. We can only be Northern Trust. We can only give the experience that we need to and want to give to our employees. And then my, my thought is that that would far outweigh any iterative pieces that one might hear from the media because they're living day to day with Northern Trust and hopefully we're giving them a great experience and um, that'll keep those that we need and want as a part of our workforce. Great. Great. Well, I'd like to pause here and see if there are any audience questions. I haven't seen any come in, but please feel free. We have a couple of minutes. We'd love to hear from you. It's always difficult virtually because we can't see you out there watching. <laughs> so um, hopefully, um, if you have a question, you, 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 you can put it in the box and we can, we can answer it. Um, I'll give it another second. And, and, and if not, you know, I think what I want to say here is a fantastic panelist. Thank you so much for your insight. We've just scratched the surface around leadership, around culture and engagement, around the hybrid world we're living in. You know, these are things that we are going to continue to struggle with and evolve from. And so your insights have been really valuable uh, for sure. Um, it's been a pleasure hosting you all. And I think with that, um, I would love to hear Katie, Amber, Arnold, any parting comments before I hand it back to Kim, because we'd love to hear sort of last thoughts on, on these big meaty topics. I would just share um, my mother. My mother used to often say, you, you have no idea what's happening in a person's life. There's a famous quote that right now I cannot get right, but it is about, you know, there's, there's a story behind every person and every person has, you know, something in their own that's going on. So this is an opportunity for us to listen to our employees and colleagues and appreciate that, you know, we are all going through something. We're trying to go through some things together with our organizations and really just you know, making sure that we're supporting our colleagues and our employees during this time and, you know, helping to support our leaders and managers with the empathy, with the opportunity to create those moments that matter for their teams. I think it's, it's just such an opportunity for us to be human. And um, I appreciate so much being a part of an organization that really values that and, you know, supports it. So thank you very much for this opportunity as well. well guess, guess what, guys? We, we have some questions, Arnold. May I, can, I, can I jump into those? <laughs> and then we'll hear your last thoughts. Thank you so much. Well, we'll start uh, with the first question. Um, do you view the current risk of disengagement, quiet quitting, as a short-term reflection of pandemic stress or a long-term trend? And Arnold, because I cut you off, maybe I'll start with you on that one. Well, I mean, my thoughts on the reality of quiet quitting has been around forever. I mean, you know, it's, it's heightened certainly by uh, many of the things that people are facing, you know, from a mental and well-being and all the stresses that one may have. But, you know, it, it probably will be long term. Uh, but I think our strategy then needs to be long term relative to how we, um, you know, work with that piece. Right. So not only are we looking to hire the right and best people that fit along with our culture, um, but we also need to be looking to retain and and there's a number of different tactical pieces, um, but I think ears wide open, some of the things that my colleagues have said on the panel, engaging uh, with your employees. Um, you know, I always say to my team and anybody that I can speak to um, that before, you know, Jane Doe was an employee of Northern Trust, in my case, she was Jane Doe, right? So getting to know her personally, you know, uh, things about her family, things that make, you know, her tick, et cetera, uh, at least allows for the openness of conversation to trust. So when I have issues with the organization, I'm not keeping it quiet. I'm going to a leader because they've established a relationship um, with me. 
And then three, if you, as a leader, um, feel that maybe there is a person who has quietly quit, there's nothing better than to have a conversation with them, understand their why, um, seek to understand. Um, and then if solvable, great. But if not, at least we made it an attempt for the solve for quiet quit before they really quit. So uh, that would just be my perspective there. Great. Another question. Uh, Katie mentioned using external vendors for engagement and culture. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how they help? Um, and if it was Corn Ferry, no, I'm joking. It doesn't have to be Corn Ferry. But <laughs> go ahead. No, I, I won't name the firm because uh, we have a couple <laughs> great partners on, on, on the call. Uh, yeah, I think it really helps in terms of holding up a mirror to us, right? So that we can be really honest. Um, we had the outside group actually host our focus groups. Uh, we organized them and then kind of stepped out. Uh, I think that helped uh, openness and candor. We also did this across geography, so it wasn't just in the U.S. Um, I also think, too, when we present the findings back to our executive leadership, again, this objectivity uh, in terms of what we were seeing and hearing. So that's one huge advantage. And then quite honestly, uh, one of the co core focus areas we have going forward is to really improve and enhance our organizational communication around our culture, uh, our employee experience, and we just didn't have the internal expertise to do that. And um, that's become very evident. So uh, that's why we also utilized an outside firm. Yeah. And just coming from an outside firm, I would say for, you know, this stands for any, any of us as consultants, people tell us things that, things that they don't necessarily tell people within their organization. So having that, that piece of data as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just all comment, right. we have our own yeah. engagement surveys and other internal feedback mechanisms, right? So, yeah. so this is certainly supplementing it, but it was in addition to that we thought uh, was a good time to gather. Yeah. Great. Well, there's a few more questions, but unfortunately, we, we, we do need to pass uh, on the mic back to Kim uh, just to wrap up here. So what we'll, we've recorded what these questions are, and we will get back to um, we'll get back to you with some information on the ones that we weren't able to address. So without further ado, thank you, panelists. And Kim, I'll leave it with you. Thanks, Radhika. Oh my gosh, what a great conversation. I feel like we could talk about this all day. So good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Swoboda, founder and CEO of Aspiration Catalyst, and it's not morning anymore. It's now afternoon. So um, I'm the co-chair of the Executives Club Talent and Culture Forum. We're so happy you were able to join us today. And I would love to begin with a big, huge thank you and virtual round of applause for our panelists today, Amber, Arnold, Katie, we could listen to your words of wisdom. We so appreciate your openness. Um, thank you, thank you for all that you shared with us today. So much value um, and how we can deal with these challenges that we're having in our talent landscape today. Radhika, you did an amazing job moderating and creating great value for our audience. So thank you so much for that. So I have two things that really struck me about today's conversation. Um, the word listening. Uh, was said over and over again. And Arnold, I loved your visual of the two ears and one mouth so that we're using our ears more. That's, uh, I think that we'll, uh, we'll remember that uh, today. And then, you know, thinking about the organization, being flexible, one size fits all is not working. We need to be in touch with what's happening within our own organizations and maybe stilling, you know, some of the fears, right, that are getting stirred up because of what's happening out in the broader marketplace. Um, so the multi-generational, the diverse organizations that we're part of, listening is critical to understand what does our business need and what do our colleagues need and how can we find that intersection between those two things. And then finally, near and dear to my heart, the importance of leadership and employee engagement and how we need leaders that are not only leading with their heads, but also with their hearts. So we need leaders that can deal with ambiguity. They need to listen deeply. Again, that word listening and the, inspire, the importance of inspiring and motivating. Like instead of you must come into the office, it's 
here's why you want to come into the office. So um, thank you again to um, our, our panelists and moderator and our great audience for being here today. So if you love today's event, we have more in store. The Exec Club is in full swing and you wanna check out the full lineup of programs and you can do that at www.executivesclub.org. Um, a couple of my favorites coming up, Portillo's is coming to talk and there's gonna be lunch too. So sign up for that one. Um, and of course the economic outlook is coming in January. I've already registered for my table don't miss out, make sure that you get yours too. So thank you again, everyone for joining us. Please be well and enjoy the rest of your day.